Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord tonight. I hope you come expecting God to move tonight in a powerful way. What a service we had this morning. Amen. Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Don't, let's, let's give him praise for this morning. I've been praying and praying and praying for God to show up like that. And, and I hope it ain't just a one-time thing. I, I tell you, I need that kind of service every Sunday. Amen. And so I'm just praying that God, you know, that, that we can worship freely. We can obey God freely and you know, just how many of you know that when we come to church, the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That word liberty means freedom. Amen. And if we are not free to worship and to praise God, then why do we do this? Amen. But God's been too good to us not to praise Him. So um, anyway, so what a powerful service this morning. I will continue next week on our part two of the fast. Um, hopefully people are getting behind it and like I said if you have not been fasting or you've met you hadn't you know done as good as you'd like to or whatever that's so okay. I mean even though God's not angry with you you need we need to understand I don't want people to think that there's pressure on you this is something that you pray about that you volunteer to do on your own um, the only person that I know of that'll put pressure on you is my wife amen you can look like that if you want to it, it never fails. I'll, I'll go, this past week I decided when I woke up, I believe it was Friday, um, or th whatever day it was I worked, I think it was Friday, and I decided I was going to fast while I was working. And so I did, and I fast all day long. I had no nothing to drink. I mean, total fast all day long. I get home and I decide that I want to eat, and I want to drink something, amen. And I told my wife that I wanted some Mountain Dew. And she said, well, what about the fast? I thought you was fasting. I'm like, listen, okay, no. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. But the fast is between you and the Lord anyway. But, but anyway, the, the point of the fast is to grow closer to God, is to see the hand of God move. And so that, that's the whole point. And I'm telling you, we're already seeing him move. Amen. We've had some, and I'm just be honest. You know me, I'm an honest person. We've had some dry services lately. Amen. It's just been kind of dead. And I don't like dead services. Amen. Because I go home and I say, God, did I mess up? Did something go wrong? What happened? But um, if we worship, God will show up. Amen. He's not going to go where he's not invited. Amen. So um, <clears throat> anyway, so we thank you for that. Remember next week, those of you that are workers on the council or whatever it is you do, if you are a worker in the church, please show up. We're going to have our workers meeting. My wife and I are going to feed you. We're probably going to do, we well, might cater Subway. So that way if you're fasting meat, you can fix you a veggie sub. If you're fasting bread, you can just fix you a sandwich. If you're not fasting at all, you can fix your whole sub. Amen. Just whatever makes your heart happy. Amen. So uh, I think that might work out best. But anyway, let's stand all over this house. Anybody got any prayer requests you want to bring before the Lord this, morning, uh, this evening? <coughs> Holly Mills texted me this morning. I don't know if some of you may know her. She texted me this morning and said, God has really, really been dealing with her. Said she's been watching our services, and God has really been dealing with her heart and been wanting to come to church, but for whatever reason was not able to, um, but asked that we would continue to pray for her, continue to pray for her dad, um, Mr. Richard, and, and continue to pray for him. He's home. He's recovering, thank goodness, um, doing good. Um, as some of you know, he was in the hospital for a while, and then he went to the, uh, to the um, what's the name of that place over here? The nursing home or the recovery home, BFs, 
whatever it is. Anyway, he went over there, and he was there for a little while. But he's home now, and he's recovering, which is good. And he said that when he's back on his feet, he's going to come to church. And so we're thankful for that. Um, but be praying for them. Be praying for all those that are sick. Sister Dolores, she's having some. Uh, uh, she's had a, something happen to her skin. Um, she's been that the poor sister. She's been battling a lot. Let's pray for her. She's been dealing with a lot. Um, pray for Sister Jane. Continue to recover and heal. Brother Tony, I forgot to mention this morning, fell a couple of weeks ago, broke his ribs. Um, that's why he hasn't been here. And after he broke his ribs, he got pneumonia. Bless his heart. And so he had broke ribs with pneumonia, and not a good recipe. Um, so we're praying for his quick recovery. Um, he said as soon as he's back, he'll uh, back on his feet. He'll be back here. Um, at church. Is there anybody else got any prayer requests? I do, Pastor. Um, I got to go to the hospital next Thursday and have a few tests done. Uh, just pray that everything will you know, be okay on them tests. Okay. Remember my family story. I'm still dealing with some things. You know. Anybody else? Yeah, and yes, Jamie's done gone through a lot in the last two or three months, which started out as a sore on a toe, I believe it was, and kind of worked its way from there. Miss Carlos, yeah, she was here. She was in nursery, yeah, she was here. Yeah. She's good. Carlos is good. She's just been with her family a lot. Um, so she's not really been home a lot lately, so, but, yes. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Amen. 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 Yeah, I know when I first came here and met little Connor, I found out right away that's a special little boy. God's got a great, great anointing on him. Amen. Anybody else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's just ask God to touch all these requests. And any unspoken, um, God knows that need. Just lift up the hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your love, grace, kindness, and mercy. And, Lord, we just ask you right now, God, that you be with us today. Lord, we ask that you touch each and every one of these request tonight lord you know every need and god we ask that you just move in a mighty way lord we need your touch lord those that are sick in the body lord i pray that you'll just touch their bodies lord god that you will just heal them lord lord we are believing that you are going to move mountains lord we are believing god that you're going to break chains lord we're believing god the lord that even through this fast that what seems to be insurmountable obstacles are going to be removed and cast out of our way lord mountains that seem to have gotten in our way will be thou removed because lord that kind of faith cometh by fasting and lord i just pray god that you will just touch and bless this church let us be a light in this community lord help us to reach those that are lost and dying and hurting without you and god we give you praise for all that you do in jesus name amen and amen grab your red back hymnals and we're gonna worship the lord amen Page 390. If you got a red back, praise 390. There's power in the blood. There's not going to be any words on the screen. We ain't got nobody back there to work it. So, um, page 390 in your hymn. No, it's, they're not on the screen. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you believe all the victory win? There's 
wonderful power in the blood. Come on, sing. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the In the precious blood of the Lamb Would you be wider, much wider than snow There's power in the blood, power in the blood Sin stains are lost in the life-giving flow There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb, there is power. Oh, do you still believe there's power in the blood? One working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus our King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily with praises to sing? There's wonderful power. Oh, come on, sing it if you know it. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood. Come on, sing it again. Sing it again. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. What was the next page? 177. Are you washed in the blood? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Y'all feel that already? Amen. Are you washed in the blood? Come on, sing it if you know it. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Is our, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest? in the crucified are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb 
when the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bride? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this house. You may be seated for a few moments if you can. Amen. Are you washed in the blood? Amen. There is still power in the blood. Oh, we can do better than that. I said there is still power in the blood. Amen. If we can get our ushers to come at this time, if you did not tithe this morning, now is the time to do it. Amen. Didn't get an amen out of nobody but myself. That's it. Brother Ronnie, if you'll pray over this offer. Thank you for your giving. If you want to stand, I appreciate it. We're going to stand. We're going to do one more song. And I actually kind of requested this song. I wanted, I said, I want to hear Old Rugged Cross or Amazing Grace. And everybody said, we haven't done Amazing Grace in a while. And I don't know about anybody else, but when I think about that statement, Amazing Grace, amen. Grace is, is, is good, but when you put it in, in its definite terms, it is it is more than just good. Amen. It's, more, it's amazing. It's amazing. And His grace is amazing. You know how I know? Because He took an old wretched person like me. Come on, church. Somebody who was drowning in alcohol. Somebody who was drowning in depression. And changed my life around. And set me on the solid rock. And I'm telling you, if not for grace. Oh, glory to God. If Come on, church. I know I'm not. If not for grace. Where would I be? Amen. Let's sing Amazing Grace. Amen. Page 57 if you need to know. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That saved the wretch life
this time my my son is going to come take his place in the lord um as you know he's been i've been giving him a lot of opportunities to speak be praying for him on february the what day 21st second third that's my birthday never mind yeah february 21st he is going up to the state office to take his exhorters test and um that's the first that is the first line of credentialing in order to get his ordination his license his license his ordination and his bishops um so he's been studying he's been so far he's done pretty good but he don't know what's about the head of him once he passes that exhorters that's when the heat gets turned up amen and so i he, i want to give him opportunities um the more he gets opportunities the better i believe he gets at preaching and preparing and delivering the word i honestly wish i had someone who would have given me the opportunities that i've given him i understand what it's like being a young minister trying to you, you got all this fire inside of you want to get it out and you know it feels like you never have opportunities and so um i've been praying i prayed and i asked god how i could once one way i could help train him because i believe he's going to grow up to be a great pastor he's got a he's got a pastor's heart he loves people but he's got to come out of his shell a little bit and so getting him out of shell the best way to do it is get him out there in front of people amen you can't stay in a shell if you got 15 20 30 people looking at you amen and so um that's what we're trying to do and so if those of you i love you and if you came to hear me preach tonight god bless you god bless you but you're going to get daniel tonight amen so and if you really and truly want to hear me come back wednesday night and you'll get to hear me then so that's time, Daniel, if you'll come on up and take your liberty in the Lord. Amen. All right, there I am. Can y'all hear me? <clears throat> Good. All right. As my daddy explained, I am taking the exhorters test February 21st. And there is over a, thou a lot of questions. We'll just say that. There's a lot of questions on that thing. And I asked Braxton, who took the exhorters test before, too. I said, how is it? He said, well, some of them are multiple choice, and some of them you got to fill in the blank. I'm scared about filling in the blank. <laughs> because every time we, we go over the test, my wife will read the question. I remember the question, but I go, uh, got choices? <laughs> 
And she'll start saying some of the other, you know, answers. And I'm like, oh, well, that one's it. She's like, yeah, that one's it. I'm like, yeah, I got it. I got it now. Then she'll wait an hour or two, go back to the same question, and I'll say the same thing. Choices? So it is a, it is a long test and a hard test to <laughs> remember because there's so much to remember. And um, everything is biblically based. That's what I love. Everything is biblically based. I may have trouble remembering the verses and where to find them, but I could quote them for you. But I probably won't tell you where to find it because I probably don't remember. But today, uh, the story I have for you is one that I've preached before, but I learned something, and fact check me if you want to, but I read it in a book. This story that I'm reading in John was actually removed from the original manuscripts by a guy named Augustine. The reason he removed the story is because he said Jesus was too soft on the sin. Because during this, this day, and I'll explain it when I go into it, but the law of Moses was the one being enforced at this moment in time in John. So when Jesus did what he did, Augustine said, I'm going to take it out because it was too soft on sin. So it actually was in the original manuscripts. Then when he took it out, it became, and I'm going to butcher the word, but I'm going to try to say it, a unispical manuscript, which means it is a singular story outside of the original manuscripts, which means this is what, what it was written as when King James got it. It was just a unique story written by John about Jesus that he put into the Bible, which it was originally in the Bible. So I'm glad King James felt the need to do it. So the um, verse I, verses I have is John 8. Verse starting in verse 1, if you'll read for the, stand for the reading of God's word, um, I'll give you a minute to get there. John chapter 8, verse 1, starting in verse 1, we're going to go down to verse 11. All right, it says, now I may have a different version than y'all reading because it, this is the English Standard Version, because I need it dumbed down. I can't be reading all them these and thous. I'll probably get tongue-tied. So, it said, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. He sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been called in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him that he might have some charge that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and with his finger wrote on the ground or wrote in the sand. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone at her. And once he bent down again and wrote on the ground again. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, go and from now on sin no more. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing everybody here safely, Lord, and have your way in this service. Let me say what you would have me to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I wrote down that Jesus is the absolute picture. There are two pictures that are being painted here. One of an accuser and one of an advocate. The accusers use legalism, which I had to Google because I didn't know what it meant. But all legalism means is somebody who stands under and upholds the law. So these people who go on legalism are normally people who condemn others but don't condemn themselves, which means they like to hold their actions above other people. And this is what the Pharisees were doing. They brought the woman to Jesus saying they caught her 
in the very act. Like, it wasn't like, oh, well, she confessed to it. No, they caught her in it. And they said, such as the law of Moses, this woman should be stoned. So if a woman was ever caught in adultery, she should be stoned. And they brought her to Jesus and said, that's what the law says. What do you say? I love this right here. I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I'm going to say it anyway. It says that he bent down, ignoring them, by the way. He ignored them, bent down, took his finger, and wrote in the, wrote in the dirt. Now, I'm going to try to pronounce this word because I am horrible at pronouncing these words, especially the Greek words. Okay, the Greek word for right is... Okay, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. It starts with a K. If you want to figure it out, go, go, go and let Google say it for you because I ain't going to try to say it. But that word actually means he wrote against them or to reveal. Why are y'all quiet? That, that is awesome. So when Jesus wrote in the dirt, he revealed something to them. And then what is the... Very second thing he said when he stood up, he said, He who is without sin cast the first stone. So what did he write in the dirt? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm interested in. I want to take a time machine and look down at the dirt and see what he wrote. Because write in the Greek word means to reveal or write against. So when it says he wrote in, this, in the dirt, he revealed something to them. Now me being nosy, I want to know what it is. I want to know what he said. But sadly, John doesn't. Tell us what he wrote in the dirt. And after he said it, he bent down again and wrote in the dirt. So he revealed not one thing, but two things to him. And all of them, now in my version it didn't say it, which I'm sad it didn't say it, but it said, being convicted by their own conscience. So all of them being convicted by their own conscience, starting with the oldest, Ending with the youngest, they all turned away, dropped their stones, and walked away. So, Jesus is the embodiment of something called an advocate. He stands in love for another person. That person's guilty. That person is, of course, she was absolutely guilty. She was caught in the very act. She was caught in it. It wasn't like, oh, she confessed. Like I said, she was caught in it. And Jesus stands in between them. A woman who's guilty. And says, are you without sin too? If you are, cast it. And the book I was reading said that what he meant by that is anyone who has not even had the same fault as she did. And all of them turned away. Dropped their stones and walked away. All of them. So Jesus stands in love, and a lot of times love is more compassionate than legalism. Legalism goes strictly by laws, strictly by what the law says, and the law is meant to reveal sins. But God's love and blood covered those sins. So... The Pharisees, and I wrote this, were trying to bring a charge against Jesus because in those days, I didn't know this either. You know, when you read the Bible and start doing research on it, I feel dumb sometimes. I'm like, I thought I knew this story. I really did. Then you start looking into it, you're like, wow, I knew nothing about this story. But they tried to bring a charge against him. The charge was is that no Jewish man could order an execution of someone else. Only the Romans could. So if he would have said, yeah, yeah, she should be stoned, he would have been arrested by the Romans right then. That was the charge they were trying to bring against him. And if we read on past 11, he actually stands and says who he is. And they say, well, what you say you are is false. Because he was saying he is the light of the world. And they were like, no, 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 no. That's false. That's after verse 11. But here, they were trying to get him to commit, basically commit a crime. 
and basically contradict his self. And now let's focus on the woman. This woman has been drug out in front of everybody. Now, women during these days were not treated very fairly. If I do say the least, they were not treated like humans. Pretty much treated like property. So she was drug out. Probably kicked and drug along the way too. They brought her in front of Jesus. A man she probably heard of too. She was probably ashamed, embarrassed, and terrified. Can I tell you, she is a living embodiment of us. In sin, you can get ashamed. You can get embarrassed. And you can get terrified. See, a little something about me, and I say this all the time. I had friends that weren't very good influences on me. But one of my friends in particular wanted me to sneak out of my house and go hang out with him a lot of times. And I'd always tell him I was too scared to go hang out with him because my daddy would be waiting at the door being like, where were you all night? He said, no, that ain't right. I said, yeah, it is. You try it. We'll, we'll try it. I said, I wouldn't even get down to the end of the driveway before he'd be like, hey, Daniel, where you at? Why? Why was it that? Why was I so terrified? Because my father had a one-on-one -on -one, you know, relationship with God, and two, he knew everybody. So there could be somebody just so happened. To look out and see me and be like, oh, wait, hey, that's Daniel. What's he doing at the end of the driveway? I don't call, don't call his dad. See what? And then I get in trouble. You know, I always wondered why my friends could go out and have, do, do whatever, do whatever. Didn't matter what they did. They could get away with it. But me, I'd always get caught. Always get caught. I heard this story of one guy. And I promise I'll move on. One guy, he's a pastor now. He said that. He went out with his friend one time. He snuck out of his house. And he went out with his friend one time. And he was driving, by the way. He was driving two of his friends who were drunk. So he was driving them. He wasn't drunk himself, but he was driving. He wasn't supposed to be out. And this cop pulled up behind him, blue-lighted him, pulled him over. Now, he was sitting in the front seat. What? He did know is there was also two open beer bottles beside him as well. So that's two hefty charges. So the man comes up to him and surprise, it's his dad's brother. He used to say when he got up to the window, he was like, hey, I didn't know you were supposed to be out. And he got arrested too. So the thing about that is that Jesus also embodies the image of an intercessor as well. Not just an advocate, but an intercessor, which means he stands in between our accusers and us. The one who's throwing accusations at us, Jesus stands in between us and them. And the reason why I could never go out and do something bad like my friends could because there was somebody interceding on me. So he stands between us and our accusers. He also stands between us and the law of atonement. See, it says, uh, I think I have it right here. No, I didn't write it down. Man, my brain didn't want to work with me that night, I guess. But it says that there is no remission of sin unless something dies. Where there's sin, there's death. So the only way to atone sin is if something dies. 
Jesus came to be that atonement. So when these Pharisees were throwing accusations at her, he became her atonement. He said, no longer shall the law hold you down, for he had showed grace. See, when the grace is applied to us, when we accept Jesus into our heart, we no longer look like ourselves, we look like Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean we are Jesus Christ. See, somebody got that confused when I told him we look like Jesus. He's like, oh, so you're saying I'm Jesus? No, I'm not, I'm not saying Jesus. I'm just saying spiritually you look like Jesus Christ. And no more condemnation. Condemnation can come your way. Right. Nobody can throw an accusation at you. Next thing, I'm flying through this. Y'all are quiet tonight. He reconciled the woman... Back to God. Of course, I had to Google what reconcile meant because I don't know what it means either. It says to restore a broken relationship to bring two parties together that were alienated. Also, Google alienated means separated or didn't know each other. So, there's a lot of Google in, in these sermons. I'm just saying because sometimes they be using big words I don't understand. But reconcile means to restore a broken relationship. Have you ever tried to restore a broken relationship? Most of the time that broken relationship don't get back together, I can tell you that. Once something is broken, I always relate a related reconciliation to this. It's like when you hit a ball and you knock over a vase and it breaks. I've seen a book where the boy literally tried to put it back together with duct tape. That's something I would do. But he literally tried to put the vase back together with with duct tape. And he thought painting it the color of the vase would make all the cracks go away. And make the the duct tape look exactly like the vase. He's like, yeah, it looks exactly the way it should be. And he went in his room and didn't say anything else about it. Now, in this book, the mother didn't recognize the vase for about three days. Until she looked at the vase and said, that vase don't look right. She went up and picked it up, and since the duct tape was so loose, it fell apart in her hand. Needless to say, the boy got in trouble. Because he didn't do a good job of putting it back together. But what God does, what, what Jesus did is he tried to bring back us, bring us back to a one on relationship with, with God, with God the Father. He was the he was the bridge. He he stood in the gap. That's what he did. He tried to reconcile us back to God. And then I got two more two more points. I'm going to point out. He provided deliverance for this woman. In, but he said, neither do I condemn you. He did not condone what she did. By no means, it was wrong. The law had judged her adultery. Because right after that, in verse 11, he says, go now and leave your life of sin. So he had forgiven her and freed her from her sin. Well, we always like to over, we, we like, ooh, deliverance, Yeah! But we don't like the second part was don't do it again. I can tell you there was a couple of times when I was getting disciplined. I might have said now, you know, what you did was wrong. And I'm like, ooh, he ain't about to get me in trouble. But then he says, don't do it again. I'm like, oh, well, I'm getting in trouble. Because we, we love the part of, Oh yeah, the chains are broken. Everyone's free. They can they can run free and they can they can do it. They, they can they can live a free life. It's a clean slate. But they don't like the second part where it says you can't do it again. We can't do the same thing over and over again. Forgiveness only takes us so far. 
We've got to be willing to change. Deliverance without freedom is just fancy words. What do you mean, preacher? Well, I'm about to tell you. If we come up uh, to the altar, cry over that thing that's holding us down, and we feel God loosen the chains up and they drop off of us, but we go right back and pick them chains right back up and take them right back out the door with us, you're free for what? We're free from what? Picked them up and took them right back out the door with us. And then the last part, Brother Marion, can you play me something? The last part that I'm going to give you is the advocate part. Because this whole story is based on Jesus being an advocate for this woman. The whole story is showing how Jesus stands in the way of someone accusing someone else and saying, no, I will pay that price. They don't need to be condemned by what you're accusing them of because I will stand in between them. Why? No, for, for all being honest, we've probably had a couple rocks in our hands before. I know I have. Put myself on. Well, I sinned, but I didn't do as bad as they did. I know what I did was wrong, but it wasn't as bad as this person. What you're doing is throwing a stone. I seen this show. It's supposed to be funny. This guy that was standing there, they were talking, and he picked up a stone and threw it and said, What was that? And the guy was like, you literally just threw a stone trying to divert my attention. That's all throwing a stone is. Diverting attention. I have darkness, but it's not as dark as them. Look, 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 look at what they did. Oh, that, that's horrible. God said it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Oh, that means it don't matter what your credential is. Pastor, reverend, bishop, deacon, elder, doesn't matter what it is. You are no different from this woman they brung to him. You are no different than her. You're not higher than her. You're not mightier than her. You're on the same level. Jesus' posture is down in the dirt. The very posture of Jesus is down in the dirt. What's the first thing he did? He drew in the dirt. The people we should be reaching is in the dirt. The people we should be advocating for are in the dirt. The people we should be reaching to are in the dirt. The mind and the heart of an advocate is what Jesus said while sitting at. He said, One of the greatest commandments love thy neighbor. I wrote it down somewhere, but I can't find it. Love thy neighbor. Said they will not know you by the way we pray. Oh, Holy Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They won't know you by that. They won't know you by slapping your hand on somebody's head, almost jerking their neck out of joint, praying over them that way. They won't know you by that. They won't know you by speaking in tongues. They won't know you by running around the sanctuary 17 times. They won't know you by how loud you shout. They will know you by the love you have for one another. Can I tell you, I did, I did an experiment. I love it. 
the most hateful people I've talked to because I used to go up to people at my work. Some were Christians, some were not. And I'd ask them, what do you think of church people? The unsaved ones surprised me. They were like, oh, they're the nicest people I've talked to. The church people were the one condemning each other. The church people were like, they're judgmental, they're evil, they're horrible. They, they will judge me right when I walk in the door. Right when I walk in the door, they're all eyes. Why when I walk in the door, they think the church is going, oh my God. I can't believe she's back. I thought we ran her off last week. The church people were the ones being hateful. The unsaved was like, they're the nicest people I talk to. And church folk were like, they're the most hateful people ever. That's not right. We shouldn't be throwing accusation at our brothers and sisters. We should be lifting them up. We shouldn't say they're hateful people. I said that to someone. He's like, well, if the shoe fits, they should wear it. It's like, yeah, but the same stone you throw at them, the same stone they're going to throw at you. Which one's going to hit harder? Jesus is our advocate tonight. So the whole premise of this story is, is about an advocate. My prayer and my challenge to this church is when that person tries to run you off the road on the highway, instead of trying to run them off the road too, how about pray, pray over them? Pray, pray good things over them. Now, I won't tell the story. I've told it before about what an advocate will do. This man walked into church, and the pastor was preaching. And the man came up to him after church. And him and the pastor got into kind of this altercation, and the church heard it. And this man was very loud and didn't care what came out of his mouth to the pastor. And right when that man walked out the door, the pastor bowed his head and prayed good things over the man. The man got in his car. His car didn't crank on the first turn. He had to turn it a couple times to finally crunk up. He pulled out of the parking lot, made it five minutes down the road, and his tire blew out. So he got out, changed that tire. He got back on the road. Couldn't get no more than two miles down the road. Both of his front tires, including the donut he put on, blew out. So he had to call his wife, tell his wife, I'm stuck. So she got in her car, was going to come pick him up. Her tire blew out. So he had to call a tow company. The tow company said, we'll be there in five minutes. Four hours later, they finally got there. And he was like, what took so long? He was like, well... Wait, no, I got it wrong. The tow company called him four hours later and said, we're not going to be there for another couple more hours because we're stuck in traffic. We can't get out. So he had to walk back to the church he just left and had to wait. And guess who was still there? The pastor was still there. The man walked up to the pastor and said, What did you say when I walked out of here? He said, Oh, I just prayed good things over you that you'd come back next Sunday or come back a couple hours later. He was like, What do you mean? He said, You're just in time for night service. It's crazy how God works. It's crazy how God works. So... That is my challenge today for you, church, is have the mind and the spirit and the embodiment of an advocate. No more 
of accusing and all this other stuff because a lot of times church people are the ones that accuse each other. So, be the embodiment and show Jesus to a lost and hurting world. We'll not close out any service. If you need prayer, these altars are open. Well, church, that is all I got for you tonight. Hope that we'll embody an advocate. That's what the point of this message is, to be an advocate. So, come back Wednesday. Last Wednesday, I actually was able to study the lesson that they had on Mark. Wow, was that an interesting chapter. Chapter 6. That's an interesting chapter right there. Um, it's talking about the execution of John the Baptist. That, that, that story, wow. Okay, wow. I read it and I was like, I didn't know that was a Bible story, but I do now. Yeah, I do now. <laughs> so if you want to know what that is, go read Mark chapter 6. Yeah, yeah, that is, the, that is one messed up episode of MTV you've ever seen. So. That's all I got for y'all tonight. Be back Wednesday. Brother Ronnie, if you'll dismiss us in prayer.